Okay, so I am here to entertain, and the uh, reason I put this uh, transparency up is uh, to scare you. I'm not going to give you a class in thermodynamics uh, the way you're used to seeing, uh, but I want to submit a message that uh, people are afraid of thermodynamics, especially second law and questions about entropy. It seems to be a topic that uh, is not taught in schools, in high schools, even in undergraduates, uh, in America at least. Uh, there's lots of uh, programs that don't have thermodynamics in them. And people are scared of the mathematics, and they're scared of the formalism, they're scared of the uncertain definitions. And my own experience was uh, terrible. I, when I was studying uh, in Hebrew University in Jerusalem, thermodynamics under a very famous uh, physicist, um, we didn't understand anything. By the end of the course, it was just going over and over Carnot machines, and if you asked me what is heat, I couldn't answer it. So the formalism took over, and the physics was completely obscure. And then uh, I started liking it much, much later when I understood that that's actually the most beautiful subject in physics and so many sciences, where um, a bunch of really interesting historical figures figured out laws that are completely not obvious uh, and uh, the tale of these people and how they found the laws and what the arguments were uh, is just a fascinating part of uh, science history. But then it comes very, very deep into the question of do we understand what information is and measurement and what does it mean to uh, store information, to erase information and so on. So you ask, what is the connection between that and heat engines? That makes it even more beautiful. So this is the, probably you've seen it, the, all the different formulations of uh, the second law. The first uh, is the simplest one and the most intuitive one. If you have a hot and a cold, the heat will flow from the hot to the cold and not vice versa. Uh, and uh, the second formulation uh, by Carnot actually, you cannot extract work by having just one temperature bath. So if you're sitting on the sun, very hot, lots and lots of energy around, you can't use it. You can't use it to power any uh, ventilator to cool you off or to uh, pump water or to do anything like that. You need two sources of heat to do that. And then there's the maximum efficiency uh, of Carnot. And uh, then there's a question of the definition of entropy that has to be done. And uh, very beautiful mathematical theory underneath. Everything is called the... Uh, <coughs> axiomatic thermodynamics, uh, where you just define uh, multivariate functions uh, being convex and uh, derive all the laws from there. So I'm saying all this stuff, of course, is not what I want to talk about. Uh, this is uh, part of the book I'm going to show you later. But uh, what I want to talk about is the history and how I thought it could be explained to people without the formulation and without the formalism that is so uh, difficult to uh, overcome when you study it in a regular course. So the history is fascinating. Uh, this is uh, the first character in thermodynamics called Count Rumford Benjamin Thompson. I don't know, how, how many of you heard about him? Not very many. Okay, so he is actually the uh, first uh, scientist, entrepreneur, de bonheur, uh, Renaissance man, you know, whatever, uh, who uh, did lots of things in his life. Uh, he was born in a farm in Massachusetts. He was an American. Uh, he, married, yeah, he married young, uh, a much older and richer wife. Uh, and then he spied and he joined the British during the American Revolution. So therefore, he wasn't very popular in the United States. Uh, so he moved to England. And uh, here, uh, not far in uh, München, he... Uh, did some very good work for the uh, Prince of Bavaria and got the title of Count. And then he went back to use the name Rumford, who was the, uh, actually conquered the, um, uh, New Hampshire, which was called Rumford at the time. That was the uh, place where his uh, former wife uh, got uh, her riches. So he called himself Count Rumford, and that's how he's known. And he founded the Royal Institution, which was where uh, Humphrey Davy and then uh, Faraday did their electric experiments uh, later on. Uh, he had a, quite an interesting love life, including the wife of Lavoisier, who was uh, 
later executed uh, after the revolution, and he married her. So that's why he ended up in Paris, uh, also buried in Paris. Uh, and he had lots of inventions under his name. Uh, most famous one is the Rumford fireplace. It's a very efficient fireplace that prevents smoke from coming into the living room. It was very popular in England. That's Lavoisier's wife. And this is actually his grave. And the reason it's interesting is because the tombstone you see here was not erected after he died, but he did one more smart thing before he died. He donated quite a large chunk of money to Harvard University for a Rumford chair. And 100 years after his death, the Society of Rumford Admiration Society, whatever, in Harvard, uh, came to Paris to find his grave and erect this tombstone and mention all his great uh, accolades in uh, physics and thermodynamics. And uh, since then, there is a Rumford chair in Harvard. I think Tinkham had it, and now I'm not sure who he has. But uh, that shows that he was very wise uh, in uh, uh, getting his name immortalized. Uh, but what is he really known for? He's known for a very simple law, that energy is conserved. That means that heat, which was thought by the chemist to be a caloric fluid, some kind of a fluid that flows from hot to cold, was actually part of energy, and he showed that uh, experimentally. Uh, and energy is conserved was actually a surprise because people thought that energy gets lost under friction, and uh, he showed that it doesn't get lost, it gets transformed into heating. Sadi Carnot, another interesting uh, character. Um, so we all know Sadi Carnot from Carnot engines, but very few of us know that in Paris, there's a very famous Carnot Avenue, and there's lots of things for Carnot, but they're not named after Sadi Carnot because he was just a physicist. Even though he was the founder of thermodynamics, as everybody acknowledges now, uh, he uh, was the son of a very famous revolutionary and the uncle of uh, the president of, uh, of France later on. And during his life, he didn't have such a great success in his uh, career. He was a student in a, a very famous university in the Ecole Polytechnique, and a, he was a military engineer, and he published in a open literature, not a scientific journal, uh, a very famous book, uh, Reflections on the Emotive Power of Fire, where he figured out the, uh, essentially the second law and the efficiency of uh, heat engines, the maximal efficiency. But later he got into depression and he died in uh, cholera, epidemic, so all his other writings, which you don't know where they were, but he was clearly a genius, uh, they were burnt. And uh, again, I went to see his grave uh, in uh, Paris. So it mentions all his accolades, student at the Polytechnic, uh, engineer in the army, uh, uh, and then in the end, a founder of thermodynamics. So what did he say? He said a very simple thing. You cannot get any motive power from just one heat source because you need to have a warm body and a cold body in order to get motive power from it. That's an early formulation of the second law. Later it was formulated more uh, mathematically by others, and it was, uh, of course, uh, a subject of debate two, 200 years later. So um, why do we need these laws? So if you want to explain to somebody who's not a physicist, why do you need laws of physics? The laws of physics, in my opinion, are to tell you what cannot happen. That's very important because a lot of people try to make things that don't work. For instance, uh, the first law says energy conserved, says that you cannot have just a wheel spinning around uh, endlessly um, just, by, uh, just by forces not balancing each other. And when you look at it, you say, well, maybe this will turn because these guys have a larger torque than these guys, so maybe the, the wheel will turn, and the same idea was there. These were ideas that actually people believed in for many years, but if you have the law of conservation of energy, you know that such machines cannot work. Now, why is it important to have a law of physics? Because it's very difficult to prove that this particular machine and others don't work. In fact, some of them got into the US Patent Office, uh, even in the 20th century. Because when you look at forces, it's a very, very complicated deal to sum up all the forces and see that they all sum up to zero. It has to be exactly the right position and so on. But uh, 
if you have the law of conservation of energy, you know you can't create kinetic energy out of nothing, so it won't work. Second law, same thing. Second law says there's machines that don't work. Here's a machine called Feynman's Brownian ratchet. It's a bit of a Gedanken machine, very difficult to think of uh, implementing it, but it's a very interesting uh, machine for biologists, actually. What it says is here you have a gas impinging on a propeller uh, randomly. Here you have a ratchet. So this ratchet allows the wheel to turn this way, but not to turn backwards. Now, this random motion will turn into a, a motion of the wheel, and you will produce work out of a single heat source, which is T1, the temperature of the bath. Question is, can it work? So second law says it can't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, you have to work really hard to prove why it doesn't work. So for instance, this is a, my very primitive illustration of why it doesn't work. Here's a ratchet. So the ratchet allows the green teeth to go left. So you see, they can go left and they can't go right. However, that's a cold ratchet. Once the ratchet starts to heat up, then what will happen is that the lever will go up and down with the kinetic energy KB, K Boltzmann temperature. And the ratchet now can go both ways. So this unilateral motion stops working once the ratchet heats up. So the resolution of the Feynman ratchet not working is that the ratchet itself gets to the same temperature as the gas that motivates the uh, propeller, and then uh, the ratchet stops working. So uh, these are, uh, as I say, there's ways to do things in an easy and a difficult way. The easy way is just to invoke the second law. And that means no entropic perpetuum mobile can exist, like working from one temperature. So this was a law that was derived from Carnot's statement, heat flows from hot to cold. That's a very reasonable assumption. Everybody feels it, knows it, but is it justifiable from physics laws? Apparently not everybody agreed. And the most famous uh, person who didn't agree was uh, Maxwell, who said, uh, let's think of a counterexample to the second law. Imagine a being whose faculties are so strong that he can follow every molecule in its course. Such a being whose attributes are still essentially finite. I put the word finite under emphasis here. Later we'll see why. As our own, we'll be able to do what is impossible for us. So Maxwell said, Let's think about somebody who can break the second law without breaking any laws of physics we know. It's a small demon. He opens and shuts a shutter. No friction. Nowadays, we know we can have systems without friction, superfluids, superconductors. So the friction is not a problem of opening and closing a shutter. But the only thing is he opens it when the red balls, which are the fast, hot ones, go to the right, and he closes it when they want to come back. Eventually, you'll separate the hot and the cold. And now you have a high temperature here, a low temperature here. You can operate a Carnot engine and get some work when you started with a single temperature. So that letter that he wrote took about 100 years for the best physicists, including you know, the biggest names you can think of in physics and during the 20th century, until it was figured out what was wrong with this idea. So. Um, for understanding what is wrong, uh, you have to go to statistical mechanics, of course, Boltzmann. And Boltzmann uh, made a connection between a quantity called entropy, just counting the number of possible microstates, and uh, the physics of a system. So if you have, I'm taking the most simple counting of microstates, a ball on the left, a ball on the right, two possible situations, this is just configurational uh, entropy. And if you don't know if the ball is on the left or the right, for instance, you just put a mathematical line here but allow the ball to rattle through, then there's two possible states and the entropy is K Boltzmann log two. That's uh, the entropy. Now, there's another quantity called Shannon's information. And it's actually not, different in the definition from Boltzmann's entropy. But it's something completely different. It's from the realm, if you want, of psychology. It's knowledge. It's what do we know before and after a measurement. 
So before a measurement, we have a distribution, let's say a probability distribution. If it's flat, then the, entropy, the Shannon information, if you want Shannon entropy, is just log W. It's exactly like Boltzmann's uh, entropy. Um, and uh, once uh, the uh, system is in a single state, then if you put one and zero everywhere else, you get zero times log, log one. So it's, uh, sorry, you get log one times one, that's zero, and all the rest is also zero. So you get entropy is zero if the distribution is very narrow, and entropy is log w if it's wide. So how does that relate to information? Well, think of a distribution of possible outcomes of uh, anything random variable. And that has uh, some entropy. And then there's a measurement. The measurement says alpha equal 2. So my system is in alpha equal 2 state. Now I have absolute certainty that the system is in alpha 2. So my difference between the distribution, which is uncertain to certain, is just the difference of these entropies, and that's the information. So information has to do with changes of distribution functions. Again, all this is in the realm of mathematics, statistics, and if you want, psychology, knowledge. You know, what do we know, what we don't know, before and after a message. Why is that related to physics at all? It was a mystery. But Zillard figured out that it actually has to do with physics through Maxwell Demon. Let's see. So I have this very nice cylinder with a ball running in between. And I put a membrane in the center. But I don't know if the ball is on the left or on the right. So I ask Maxwell's demon, who is small and can see things, where is the ball? And he says, oh, it's on the right chamber. Now I know the ball is on the right chamber. I can connect this uh, membrane to a weight. The ball will impinge on the membrane and push the weight and lift it and give me work. Provided, of course, it's in contact with a temperature, uh, a constant temperature heat bath. And that's going to be essentially use of this ball's energy to lift weight. So you say, OK, did I make some work out of this system? Yes, I can calculate. I know the law of, you know, you know this law very well of uh, ideal gas, PV equal to nRT, but n is equal to one molecule here. So have this relation. I take the work is P dV from the half the system to the full system. And of course, uh, P is just T over V. So integrated T over V gives me log of the initial and final, uh, minus final uh, volume, which is 2. KB log 2 worth of work has been achieved in this Zillard engine. Now, why is that related to information? Because this is precisely T delta S of the system. This is the change in entropy of the system because the volume was increased by 2. And that change in entropy is exactly equal to the information that Maxwell Demon extracted from the system. So here you see that the information wasn't just something to amuse Maxwell's Demon. It's real work. It turned into real work. So this example. I think clarified that Maxwell Demon is doing something physical when he's watching. He's not moving anything, he's not breaking the first law, but he's watching and learning. And watching and learning is physical. That's a very deep concept, but you have to have it. So this concept uh, it led to uh, much more advanced uh, connections between information theory and physics. Uh, these are the main characters that uh, played a role. Landau, you might know him from the Landau formula of resistivity. Charlie Bennett is still uh, around, got the uh, um, Harvey Prize last year. And of course, Richard Feynman, who uh, I, I personally like to put him up there because I heard him give a talk about exactly this uh, when I was a student. And it really was a very impressive. I was telling uh, about this uh, talk. So anyways, uh, what did they say? They say there's also entropy and information loss in computing, in some computing uh, processes. For instance, if you had to take a system that can have two states and you turn it into one state, you lose number of states. 
So essentially, you uh, essentially get rid of information. Information lost is actually entropy increase because the other rule said that entropy decrease was information gain. That was what uh, Maxwell Demon was doing. But this is the other way around. This is saying, if I lose information, so in other words, here I have two possible states, zero or one, but always come out zero. I erase essentially the bit and change it by zero. So um, what, what, uh, what this knowledge said is that there is some amount of entropy paid or essentially achieved when you erase information. And that is actually the resolution of the Maxwell demon. So what's the idea of the mechanical Maxwell demon? You say, I'm using now a robot to do Maxwell's demon work, so I'm not assuming any superhero creature or some uh, you know, weird being that is so small that can see molecules. I'm just putting a nano camera looking at uh, molecules flying by. And they only have to give me zero or one. If they see a mo molecule, they don't see a molecule. Now, that, mo that zero or one is supposed to operate the Zillard engine, opening and shutting the levers that pull up the weight and don't pull up the weight, according to the knowledge given by this mechanical demon. So this is an idea where it's totally automatic mechanical system, does what Maxwell demon is supposed to do, but he needs to write the information somewhere in the computer. So, in order for it to be used. So, let's say he writes one on the computer, and then the one says, okay, now we have a force, and this is lifted. Now comes the second time, and he gets a zero. And now the zero will move this lever this way, and now there's no forces acting here. So, it's just a trick of essentially translating this information into work. And as you can see, it costs writing bits. Now, that doesn't really cost heat because you can think of very, very, very efficient ways of storing information without having to uh, pay any energy cost, any friction on it. And it keeps going. But what's the problem? The problem is I'm filling up my memory with bits. Now I need to get rid of those because I need to write more bits on the same memory. I don't have an infinite memory. So I need to erase a bit. But we saw before, if you erase a bit, that's an irreversible process that will cause entropy gain, which in physics means it's going to be heating, and you have to get rid of that heat. So what's going to happen when this erasure is that bits are going to be erased, clear up the memory for new action, and heat is going to be generated. So once you know that, the second law is vindicated, right? Because now you must have a cooling device here. So now you have two temperatures. One is the one that the uh, gas is in, and the other one is in your computer cooling the memory. And now you can get work out of that. So essentially, the Maxwell demon was eventually put to rest uh, by uh, understanding that there's no free lunch here. You cannot get information out of a system without later having to pay in cooling energy or in the uh, producing extra heat. So um, this was essentially the resolution. Now you can think that this is old stuff because it's from the 60s, uh, but still going on this day. I mean, there's people doing experiments, beautiful experiments in cold atoms, in, uh, in different uh, uh, systems where you can uh, study storage of bits and then the uh, erasure of the bits and uh, essentially arrive at the Caleb Boltzmann log 2 uh, entropy uh, bound on uh, erasing information. And that's just interesting that it still occupies. Uh, actually, it's a large part of uh, what goes on these days in the study of uh, quantum computation and quantum memory. And, uh, and also there's some uh, biological uh, um, aspects of uh, the second law that, that are interesting people. So. Now comes the question, okay, I told you all the stuff you might know, but is it possible to explain it without writing down complicated equations and uh, telling long stories? And the, the answer, I think, is that if you 
I engaged in a story, that's generally true now, not just for you know, teaching thermodynamics. If you engage in a story, then the information and the, and the, uh, the willing to, to understand increases quite a lot. So uh, we wrapped it up in a superhero story where uh, starts in a center of the galaxy, you know, there's a black hole. Inside the black hole, there's, an, uh, there's, there's of course, no information coming out or in. So anything can happen there, including all the laws of physics might be different. So that's where all the super, superheroes live. And they live in this uh, galactic uh, headquarters, and they have a very uh, a strict boss called Sir Bio, and he looks at the Earth with his hologram, and he sees uh, difficult uh, climactic uh, problems that we all know that are happening, and uh, he immediately realizes it's not an energy crisis, it's an overproduction of entropy. This is too much entropy production going on, and he decides to send uh, this nerdy looking superhero uh, called Max uh, to save the world, um, and he anoints him to be the demon. Now, what can Max do? So unlike superheroes that you know from before, he's very uh, mild. I mean, he doesn't have enormous forces. He can't stop rockets in their flights. All he can do is look and see molecules by through his glasses and stuff and see where they are. And um, essentially, that's one of his greatest forces. So he, uh, and uh, so Bio says, well, OK. Uh, you, have to, uh, you have to go and save the Earth, but you have to learn some uh, basic laws of thermodynamics. Not too difficult. You're going to get uh, explanations not from these uh, terrible books. Actually, this is mine. <laughs> so uh, he's not going to have to read those books. And, uh, but he's going to meet these characters I showed you before, very colorful characters. They're going to explain to him things easily. So Count Rumford is the first guy. Explains to me what energy is in a very simple way. You don't need much to understand energy. You just have to understand money. You say, oh, OK, energy is like money. It turns from form to form. You pass it around. You move it when you have a collision. You give uh, you know, 250, 250. You give 200 joules. And then uh, each one of them has a new energy. But the sum is the same. And um, takes him on a roller coaster ride. And they go down very, very fast, and he's afraid because they have a huge amount of kinetic energy. He says, we're you know, going to die. The, the kinetic energy can't go away because they learned about conservation of energy. And suddenly, uh, they stop the cart. So he said, where's the uh, energy went to? And he said, well, touch the brakes. He touches the brakes, and he feels them very hot. says, that's where all the kinetic energy went to. So uh, it didn't get lost, just got into heat. So he says, what is heat? He says, for that, you need to ask Carnot. So he goes to Carnot. Carnot takes him to his kitchen, which is uh, um, full of uh, interesting demonstrations of thermodynamics. First of all, you can see the difference between gas, vapor, and liquid just by looking at the molecules. He doesn't have to calculate anything. And he understands that hotter things have larger random kinetic energy associated with them. Uh, of course, this is a as you know, just for an ideal gas. But that's pretty much uh, the simple explanation of what uh, temperature is uh, without getting into complicated equations. And uh, then heat goes from hot to cold. You, say, you, know, you stand next to the fireplace, and you get, you're cold. The fireplace is hot. The heat goes to you. It doesn't go the other way around. So this is the law. So that's the second law. And Max. Uh, the best thing uh, I'm telling you know, high school students when I see this is never believe your teachers, no matter how charismatic they are. <laughs> so uh, he says, I don't believe it. He says, why? He says, here, I'll give you a counterexample. You say that the hot molecule gives its energy to the cold one. But why can't the cold one give the hot one some energy? Here, he shows him an experiment with peas. Here's a slow pea. Here's a fast pea. The fast pea goes fast. The slow goes slow. They collide, and if you do the uh, energy and momentum conservation in two dimensions, since it's 90 degrees, this guy will stop. This guy will go faster because it will have its own x-direction velocity plus 
the velocity you will got in the y direction, so it will go faster than before, and this one actually goes and stops. So here, he disproved the second law. Energy can go from hot, from cold to hot. And uh, Carnot gives up and says, well, I can't answer this question. Of course, he couldn't at the time, because uh, it's not Newtonic mechanics that really determines the second law. It's statistics. So he sends him to Boltzmann. Now, I'm very proud of this demonstration, because in statistics, you learn the law of large numbers. It takes, I don't know, two weeks to teach it properly. Here is a demonstration that you can do uh, very easily. Just flip a coin and put it on a scale. So every time it's heads, you put it on the left. Every time it's right, you put it on the right. So this is a completely random, if you have a fair coin, it's completely random uh, distribution. And therefore, you say, I can't predict any experiment. Right, you can't predict any experiment that's going to happen, except you can predict with certainty that after many, many, many times, the scale is going to get balanced. So even though every experiment is random, the outcome is deterministic. Certainty comes out of uncertainty. That's essentially the whole statistics, as you say, on one leg. So uh, he says, OK, so why do I need to know about large number of experiments? This is because you're thinking about large systems. So here is a small system, but you again do statistics. You want to ask, what is the possibility of closing your eyes, putting down a shot, and getting some number of fish here, some number of fish here. And you just draw the histogram. And this is, of course, something you know very well. You count the microstates, and you find that the largest column is equipartition, when you have equal number on both sides. You only have one case where everybody's on the right, one case where everybody's on the left. So that's the most probable outcome. And if it's the most probable, that's the one you want to bet on. So why is betting important? Because if you have lots, let's say 52 fish, then you get the same histogram, except now the equipartition is around 500 trillion microstates relative to one where all on the left or on the right. So these become really large numbers. And of course, once this number becomes very, very large compared to this, you can say this becomes like certainty that every experiment you'll do will get that number or something close to it. And if you want to translate it to theory of gases, you'll find that if you want to have a chamber with 1% difference of pressure, or 1% difference of number of particles on one side and the other, the chance is 1 to 1 with 20 zeros after it. So very small chance of getting a fluctuation of 1% in density based on just statistics. But what is more interesting is that many people don't realize when you ask the question, when you try it at home, try, why does air flow from high pressure to low pressure? Most people will say because there's a force moving the atoms from high pressure to low pressure. Even the force is the pressure times the area. Wrong. It's statistics. The reason the air goes from here to here once you open the shutter, is it just get to a state which is much more likely. It's not because any force is acting on the ideal gas, because the atoms don't see any forces at all, except the walls, which are all the same. So it's only statistics. If you want, he says it the following way. Laws of chance tell the gas to flow from high to low pressure. OK? And that's a very tangible force we meet every day when we pump our bicycle. So, OK. Am I doing something wrong here? Uh, go this way, yeah. So then uh, the story goes further. What can Max do? Uh, well, he first has to learn his trick. So he sees when they go to a happy hour in a place called H-Bar Cafe that there is a bouncer that doesn't allow any non-physicist in. And you see the difference between the physicist and non-physicist in terms of their dress code. Uh, and they go in, and he says, hmm, that gives me an idea. Uh, this H-Bar Cafe, by the way, is an existing uh, cafeteria at the Technion, and these are the graduate students, and uh, everyone likes to come down there and have uh, subsidized coffee twice a day. Um, and he gets the idea of running a plant, and this is a plant that I invented just 
to make it work cyclically, unlike the one that you saw before, which was a one-time thing. This can keep on going and create electricity to fire a light bulb based on the heat of tap water alone. How does it work? You have a gas, Max just opens and shuts a shutter when he sees a molecule coming from the right and doesn't allow molecules from the left to go back. Soon enough, there's gonna be high pressure here, low pressure here, just because he opened the door selectively. This high pressure goes to a turbine and makes electric power. But it won't work if you don't take care of the heat. In other words, the, the atoms that come out here are cold. So when they come down here, they become very, very tired and they won't move anymore. So you have to give them back the kinetic energy that they had at room temperature from tap water, which is at room temperature. So you'll get ice cubes out of that, which is another benefit, and you get free electricity just from the temperature of the seawater or the tap water, whatever. That was the Maxwell plant. And uh, his uh, host, Julie Calor, uh, is giving lectures on it, and everybody's uh, very amazed by the fact that you can uh, uh, get energy for free uh, with this uh, very simple Maxwell demon. And some evil people are immediately, like any time you get a good invention in physics, some evil people try to take it the wrong direction. So he, he says he wants to uh, use that trick to uh, build a plant that will separate uranium-235 from 238 just by opening and shutting shutters. And that separation plant will give them nuclear fuel. And everybody's very happy in this country called uh, Ergodistan. Uh, and they are all, uh, uh, as you say, uh, very, very uh, excited, especially the fact that they have a possibility of decreasing entropy. But once they turn on the plant, it starts heating up and going up in flames. And they don't understand what's going on. And it causes a big explosion. And uh, at this point, uh, Maxwell Demon says, I don't know what went wrong. All they did is took my work, my ideas, implemented it in some robots, and it didn't work, and it exploded. So he went to uh, speak to Feynman about it, and Feynman says, well, that's the entropy of erasure. That uh, the lesson learned here is the person who took this idea to Agodistan was an ex-physics student who didn't continue to his graduate studies and never took the uh, entropy of information erasure uh, course. So uh, he uh, caused it all to uh, blow up by the fact that the data bank was not cooled. So Max says, OK, I don't think I can help humanity decrease entropy production because uh, because if I work, I do something that breaks the second law, obviously, and he was not allowed to break laws of physics in public. I forgot to tell you, that was one of his conditions. So therefore, he can't really help now that he understood that uh, working his uh, machine was breaking the second law in public. So he said, well, uh, well before he says that, he says, I can't see trillions, I can see trillions of atoms, but I don't feel my brain heating up at all. So, you know, why, why doesn't it heat up my brain? And he says, because you're Maxwell Demon from Tachyonia, and you're not bound by the laws of physics, you have an infinite memory. This answers the Maxwell's letter. Maxwell says, a being whose faculties are finite as a zone, but Maxwell Demon has an infinite memory, therefore he's essentially at t equals zero forever, and that's why he can work. So, question is, can he help? And he says, well, so Bayer doesn't allow me to break the laws, and Feynman says, well, maybe there's a way. And this is the end of the book. I'm not telling you the resolution. It's just telling you there's a happy ending. The earth is much cleaner. There is uh, renewable sources of energy. There is, uh, the atmosphere is clean. The global warming seems not to be a problem. But he's put on trial. When he comes back to Tokyonia, Sir Bayer says, how did you help the earth? Did you break the second law? And Max says, no, I didn't. And the uh, question is, did he break the second law? No, that's something you have to figure out for yourself. But uh, that was the uh, end of the book. And uh, I think that, in a sense, 
the excitement of the story is really the excitement of thermodynamics because when you think about it, all these dirty laws of heat engines and soot and pollution and you know, stuff that goes on with the second law is actually extremely uh, fascinating mathematical uh, endeavor uh, when it comes to uh, trying to really understand why it works. Uh, so that's the uh, story. There were some uh, very nice comments I got from uh, friends. And uh, uh, as I said, the book uh, was successful with the physicists and their families, actually. Some people said that their 10-year-old snatched the comic and didn't give it back and uh, liked to read it. Uh, there's very little printed uh, comic books these days, uh, but uh, I think there's still some... Uh, advantage of paper on digital when it comes to uh, enjoying stories. So that's the thing. But I'm, I'm really uh, eager to get your questions and, you know, see if I can answer them.